Hi guys, it's Paul here from ModCon. I'd like to wish you firstly a happy new year for 2024. I hope it's a good one for you. This is my first uh, video of this year and it's actually a slight departure from the normal because this will be an insight into my painting, camouflage and rigging routines. In this first section I'm applying oil paint over a grey-green enamel shade on the cockpit floor deliberately allowing the brush to streak through the oil paint in differing directions, thus creating the wood effect. You'll also see the effect this process has when applied to the fuselage. And next coming up, this part shows the same technique applied to smaller pieces, including the propellers and engine supports. The fuel and oil tanks and the radiator surrounds were painted bronze and blackwash to bring out the detail, and the radiator fronts were painted aluminium and then also blackwashed. So that was my process for painting wood effect on the interior of the Gotha G4 kit. But the same can be applied to smaller kits as well. Here is a Roland D6B receiving its two enamel undercoats of white and tan before a slightly more experimental approach to applying the oil paint using the interior area of the fuselage as I wanted to try and determine how best to apply the oil paint on the exterior which was, as far as I know, unique in having clinker style construction where the lengths of wood slightly overlapped each other. Additional to that, some views of the completed cockpit assembly and it being test fitted into the fuselage half.
So adding in the cockpit assembly was a little tricky because the machine gun feed has to be inserted first before the rest of the assembly. And here it's looking rather good, the whole assembly now, with the fuselage halves drawn together as a temporary test fit. Now we need an engine, and this was rendered really nicely in the wing nut wings kit. Largely aluminium on the bottom, black on the top, some detail in bronze all picked out with some black washing. And once in the fuselage it looks like this. And other details, the fuel tank, the ammo box and the seat belts were all treated the same way with some black wash. And now something completely different. So now into the camouflage section. This is the underwing panels for the Friedrichshafen FF33L. Everything was painted white and then the tape was added, then the mustard for the undersurfaces. The best way I can describe this to you is the lighter the colour scheme gets, the closer it is to the finishing line. All the undersurface parts were treated the same way and when the tapes were removed, the stark white undercoat on the ribbing was overpainted in the camouflage colour and between the ribbing in order to tone down the whole appearance, including the staining. And after all this work was completed and the wings went onto the model, it looked like this. The same process was used for the underside of the fuselage. For a first attempt, I thought it came up rather well. You will actually see more of the interaction in bringing this effect around when we get back to the Gotha, because it's actually on video. The Friedrichshafen was constructed before I started doing video recording. So we're back now at the Roland model and we're on to the external surfaces and having been um, quite satisfied with the attempts on the interior to devise the best way forward for applying this paint I've now got around to doing exactly that here. Initially I had to paint a white panel on the side of the fuselage under the cockpit on both sides to hand paint the torch emblem, then carefully walk round it when applying the paint. And that brings us nicely to the end result. The rear of the fuselage was painted black and this is as far as the wood effect goes, but it came up very well indeed. 
So moving on to another aspect of camouflage, and this is the application of lozenge pattern transfers onto the wing surfaces. I've painted the wing a gloss white, which the transfers need because they are very, very thin and they require white background to maintain their subtle shades. These transfers are from the Aviatic range and are very good indeed. They're very thin as well. I hope I don't scare too many of you away with this process, but here goes. So with the transfer on the wing, I'm just wrapping the transparent edge around the top surface, which helps to hold the entire section in place. Unfortunately, I realised just here at the tip of the knife, a couple of small bits of debris, and they were showing up rather prominently. So I elected to draw back the transfer. It had just gone on, so it wasn't settled on the wing or anything like that. I removed the offending objects quite quickly. And as there was still moisture on the transfer and the wing, it was an easy enough job to turn the wing back and draw the transfer back down and into position. That really has to be done quickly if you notice it. And again on the other surface, on the opposite side I should say, of the lower wing. And that went on quite nicely. The process really is just to take some time and remove all the air from underneath the transfer. What you have to try and do also is line up the rib on the transfer with the rib on the plastic. If you get it misaligned it can look rather awkward at the end of the process. And this is what I'm doing just at the point of each rib tape, just cutting through the transfer onto the transparent edge and that helps to push over the wing easier. If you just leave it as one strip and push it over the wing that can be a bit awkward, so divide it up into small parts. So now some of the sundry items. This is the radiator having the excess black wash removed from it. And in the background you can see the wheels ready for the same treatment. And here they come now. This is a piece of lozenge transfer and you have to be careful with this A because it's circular. So you have to try and cut it to a decent circle shape and also it sits higher in the centre slightly than it does out at the edges, so just be careful when you're applying that. Sometimes making a slight incision helps to draw one edge closer to the other, but you may have to fill in a slight bit of um, gapping with some paintwork. And now the propeller spinner and the engine cowlings painted grey, green and blackwashed, and the completed radiator with its attendant pipe. And after that we have the pieces for the undercarriage and also the wheels once the hubs have been tidied up fully. And here the single piece exhaust pipe. And the next will be the rudder which is painted white but I wanted to create the illusion of the framing underneath. So this has been applied using, I think it's a, yes, a dark grey paint and some tape as guides to where the lines should show. And this will be sprayed with white again later on once this is dried, just to a stage where the grey ghosts through under the white paint. And now onto the propeller. I always hand paint my propellers and on this occasion I varied it slightly. I didn't just make it from one tip to the other. I made it look as if the darker shade of wood had been blended in in this sort of arched style. Um, and I think it came up rather well. 
So I'll let you watch the process to the end and in a few minutes I'll be moving back to the go to build to see how things progressed with that kit. And here is the completed Roland upper wing with the lozenge transfers applied. The lower wing and tailplane were finished similarly and using the same technique as you saw earlier. The fuselage has also been finished and all in all the model is coming along well. So some of you will have noticed that I'm using excerpts from three of my previous models to highlight how I address these areas of modelling. Of course, there are many other modellers who use different methods and to that end I will add some links into the information box below the video for you to take a look as to how others tackle these same issues. Again, I can only show you how I manage these areas of work. There is no particular right or wrong way to do things. The models you build are for you to complete as you choose. But I hope these insights and those of other modellers as well might give you a better understanding in how to work through your builds and perhaps develop better techniques. And please, if at all possible, try and remember to practice on an old kit before you apply any of these techniques to your favourite kit that you're building just now. You don't want to come a cropper when you're doing your very expensive model that you've just bought. And so we are going to head back now to the Gotta build in a few moments. And that will show some of the detail in the fuselage halves. And then the wing centre section with the engine mounts in place. Then some detail on the engines themselves. And then on to the external colour scheme. The engines are again finished using black and aluminium paint, which is then blackwashed. The large curved manifold intake has had crystal clear applied before painting to replicate the tar soaked strips of asbestos sometimes applied to it, leaving it bulkier in appearance. And now, coming up, the 
application of the colour scheme onto the fuselage. The fuselage markings are from the kit, although the serial number had to have the last character changed from a 5 to a 6 to represent the specific aircraft. The lorry 2 transfers came from the Fion range. And coming up next, the painting of the wings and a little more visual detail on this particular technique, which I hope you'll find interesting. After the pale blue was applied and the adhesive tapes over the rib detail had been overpainted with pale grey, the tapes were removed and the pale blue was reapplied to reduce the white undercoat on the rib detail 
and also to reduce the staining to the preferred level. And now the wings in their completed colours. Needless to say, the upper surfaces were progressed using the same technique, although I chose to use a darker shade of brown for the rib staining on the top surfaces. It's quite easy to see what effect this process has, and admittedly, while it takes a little more to see the detail on the upper wings, it is more evident on the paler undersides. In my opinion, this is a good end result, showing as it does some degree of non-uniformity due to the extent to which I chose to reduce the staining. If you wanted a more war weary appearance, then it's easy enough to leave more of the staining showing through. The lack of uniformity appeals to me, as I wouldn't have thought the signs of wear and tear would have been apparent to the same degree over all surfaces, although others may have their own thoughts about that. The images in this section of the video clearly show the size of this kit's wingspan, which when complete measures around 2.5 feet, or approximately 75 centimetres. Additionally, however, this image better shows the detail on the upper wing when seen under a better light source and from this particular improved angle. I should point out that the fitting of the top wing onto the struts isn't overly complicated. A small rectangular panel fitted to the top of the cabane struts fits into the underside of the top wing. There are some turnbuckles that require to be threaded and attached at the rear of this panel which can be difficult to avoid when lowering the wing onto the struts, but that aside, the cabane struts and engine cowling struts most definitely will hold the weight of the wing. The dihedral angle on both is excellent and as they both have some play, it is much easier to fit the interplane struts. I drew the wings together at each strut point and once the adhesive had set, I rigged that particular section, progressively working out towards the wing tips. And that leads us nicely to the last section of this video, which deals with rigging. I've started by showing some attempts to make homemade turnbuckles and this is some of the rather limited video I have recording this process, so my apologies in advance as you'll have to look very carefully at what's happening. These items were produced from thin fuse wire and careful use of pliers, and the upper combing of this Booker 131 kit shows how to firmly anchor the parts underneath. And the last section there showed the process of making these turnbuckles, whereby a small loop is created and held between thumb and forefinger. A pin is then inserted into the loop and rotated, thus drawing the neck of the loop closed. The size of the turnbuckle is determined by what extent you rotate the pin in the loop. Now some footage of me attempting to thread a turnbuckle. I left this section in to show, yes, it can be tricky, but we all have to start learning somehow. My work is rarely this difficult nowadays. Practice really does make perfect. The materials used are gas patch turnbuckles, elasticated thread and a small amount of superglue. Once I've threaded the turnbuckle, 
and I draw the short end round the eye again to get it to sit in the superglue, thus holding it in position before trimming the loose end. A recent routine at the end of this process that I used on the Booker kit, once you've attached the rigging onto the model and it has set properly, you may wish to add a thin coat of crystal clear over the turnbuckle eye, thus covering the thread with an extra layer of support, as the crystal clear is quite strong when dry, and thin coats dry quicker. And you'll also know when this is the case, as the crystal clear turns transparent as it dries out. And now, an attempt to fit a length of rigging onto a model, in this case the Roland. This piece of rigging is already attached to the lower fuselage, and this is the open end being threaded through a turnbuckle, glued, wound round the turnbuckle eye to draw it into the adhesive, and then trimmed. The following section thereafter shows the turnbuckle being fitted to the undercarriage leg. Yes, I know. You were just waiting to see if that piece of rigging held, weren't you? I bet you were. <laughs> Here is proof positive that all ended well. Right, and now it's time to return to the Gota. Its rigging was quite extensive, but it can be successful with careful application. Now awaiting the top wing, you can see the panel I mentioned earlier sitting atop the cabine struts and fitted with the threaded turnbuckles to the rear edge. The undercarriage rigging has been completed and some work has also started on the lower wing and fuselage to wing join areas. There's also some external rigging along the fuselage side starting at the bigger of the two fuselage windows and running all the way to the tail. There are different cable lines for this fuselage rigging and care should be taken to choose the correct arrangement for your model. Also visible now are the first interplan struts closest to the engines on both sides, and both wings have been permanently drawn together at this connection point to allow full rigging of this particular area. 
the middle and outer sections were completed in the same fashion. In order to gain better access to the upper rear areas of the top wing when connecting the turnbuckles, I placed the model forward on its nose to aid this process, and to access the front areas of the upper wing's underside, the model was rested upwards onto the foam block on its wheels, with the tail suitably supported by something reasonably heavy in order to prevent any possibility of it slipping backward while working on it. It stands to reason, therefore, that the rudder should not be attached before this area of rigging is complete. Next up after this, a couple of images of the Friedrichshafen's completed rigging, which was again brought about by applying these same techniques. So guys, that's the end of this video. I hope you've enjoyed it and found the various aspects of working on World War I aircraft interesting and perhaps it will encourage you to try your hand at building them. If you like what you've seen, please use the like and subscription buttons which would be very much appreciated. Remember also to have a look in on the information box below the video for further useful details. Until next time, Thanks for coming along on this journey, take care and I'll catch you soon. Cheers, bye.